Today's episode is sponsored by viewers like you and Curiosity Stream, a way to get documentaries streamed to you. Unlimited access is only $2.99 a month, and you can get the first month for free by going to curiositystream.com slash cynicalhistorian and using the promo code cynicalhistorian during sign up. More on that at the end. Hey, Cypher here. You guys all know that I like to bag on movies for being inaccurate. When they get the story right, it's a breath of fresh air. While I had plenty of bad movies to put on the list for last year, finding the best five movies was actually pretty difficult. I mean, after all, I had to resort to historical fiction. Of course, my concern for accuracy is about the story they're trying to tell, not the superficial elements. Because a story doesn't have to be bound by costume design and special effects. That's all cool to see, but that's not what makes a good story. So those kinds of things can be safely inaccurate, without much concern for me. As long as inaccuracies don't affect the story, then the movie can still be good. But there are some inaccuracies that may affect the story, but it would be unfair to criticize a movie for doing them. It's one thing to complain about films misrepresenting their subject matter, and quite another to complain about something that doesn't affect that. But this also tells us something about how the medium we are trying to tell stories through affects those stories. So that's what I want to talk about today. What forgivable inaccuracies can we expect from films? So the first thing is troop sizes, or population sizes. You know, when you see in a western town just kind of the basic storefronts and hardly anybody there, or when you see a battle, and there's like a thousand people total. Movies just can't have very large armies on the field or anything along those lines. Even the best of them, in terms of this, fail to compare to their real-life counterparts. Sometimes people will use computer-generated graphics, but oftentimes it just looks terrible. And nothing is a substitute for having real people right there. So an example of trying to use CGI to multiply all your army and just doing a terrible job of it is Alexander. You can see plenty of people on the field with this, but it's ugly as hell. And it actually doesn't compare to its real life counterpart. The Battle of Issus had 40,000 Greeks and over 100,000 Persians. Yeah, so about 140,000 people should be represented there. And yet, what they show is nowhere close, and with all this CGI, it just looks ugly. But probably one of the finest examples of having a lot of people on the field and trying to represent things with real people is Spartacus. Spartacus. I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. In that, they actually had 10,000 people on the field. This is a scene of 10,000 people marching. Of course, part of the only reason why that could happen is because they got the fascist leader of Spain to loan out troops. Yeah, those are fascists marching as Romans. <laughs> And on the polar opposite end of the political spectrum, you have Waterloo, where they got another dictatorial regime to loan out soldiers, this time the Soviets. And they got 17,000 people, though never in one grand view like in Spartacus. And 17,000 people sounds like a lot. And 10,000 people sounds like a lot. But, in terms of Spartacus, what it's representing should have around 120,000 slaves and 40,000 Romans. As opposed to Waterloo, which is supposed to have more than 70,000 French people and around 120,000 allies. 17,000 people is nowhere close to enough to represent that many people on the field. Another movie that tried to get a lot of people out on the field to represent a massive battle was Gettysburg. And they called out basically every Civil War reenactor they possibly could, totaling around 2,000 people. Of course, 
This is orders of magnitude smaller when the Union had over 100,000 people and the Confederacy had over 70,000 people at that one battle. So all this stuff about like, oh, the reenactors did a really good job and it looks really big and awesome. Yes, true, but nowhere close to real life. Now, one I've been seeing a lot of comments on is my review of Dunkirk, where a lot of people have been saying, oh, well, look, they have hardly anybody on the field. It looks like just nothing. And yeah, that's the point of this. You can't expect a movie to portray that. And if you want a bunch of CGI nonsense, I'm sure you can find a movie like that. But that's not what Christopher Nolan was going for in that movie. I mean, think about it. There had been a Dunkirk movie before, and it showed kind of a lot of people all massed together and everything, but it still pales in comparison to real life. Real life was around 400,000 people on the beach. Think about that. You're not getting anywhere close to that, and to try to pretend that it's a travesty that they're not showing enough people on the beach is not comprehending the scale of warfare. And no movie can ever achieve that. So I don't fault a movie for not doing that. Besides, something that Nolan did do was make a bunch of cardboard cutouts. So that's kind of cool. Either way, it's not worth judging a movie because of troop sizes, because no movie has ever gotten that right, and I'm pretty sure they almost never will. Now, we see in movies shootouts all the time. You'll see somebody getting in a shootout in a barroom brawl, or you'll see, you know, a battle or something along those lines. But it's always portrayed as if you could almost throw a stone at each other. But if you're shooting, if you're within a stone's throw, that's awfully close. But seriously, most battles are fought way long distances. In the army, we're taught to shoot up to 300 yards. And from personal experience in Afghanistan, we actually ended up engaging a lot further than that. And it's not as though weaponry has gotten modernized with every time. No, even by the time of World War I, that distance was pretty much the same. But could you imagine what it would look like if you just saw nothing but dots on the screen shooting at each other? It, it just wouldn't be any fun to watch. And it doesn't really convey anything besides the distance they're shooting at. Plus, the audience wouldn't understand. This is a necessary inaccuracy that people just wouldn't get because actual warfare is incredibly distant. But a lot of people get used to things like Call of Duty or Battlefield, where Battlefield mails itself as having this expansive battlefield where you can fight for an entire mile. That's pretty tiny for a battlefield. And Call of Duty is even worse than that. So public perception would stop it, public understanding would stop it, and just the ability to see what's going on kind of ends the necessity for showing distances correctly. Now this is another war kind of thing. We get a lot of war movies, so people tend to scrutinize those things. So a lot of people will look at like tanks and be like, why does Patton show Patton tanks on the German side? But that's just over scrutinization. There's no need to show the correct thing as long as there's a clear way of telling the difference between that's a German and that's an American. And Patton does a pretty good job of it. This is another thing that I've seen a lot of comments on my Dunkirk review where people are looking at the BF 109s and saying like, oh, that's a Spanish variant. Well, yeah, but they're pretty much the same plane. Plus, the Spitfires are not Spitfires. Yeah, they have a couple of real ones, but most of them are these like Soviet trainer planes. And yet, nobody's complaining about that, so I, I really don't get that, where they'll complain about 
a German plane that's pretty much identical and yet miss the fact that like the Spitfire isn't a Spitfire and I see all of that as pretty silly like what's the point it's not something that impacts you visually and you can still discern the difference between allies and Axis. There's no reason to have exactly accurate planes as long as they look somewhat on point that it's believable to the audience. But anyways, you can actually dress up these things to make them look like the real deal. Like, here's a fun thing to try. Go and watch Red Dawn and look at those tanks and try to identify what they're supposed to be and what they actually are underneath all the makeup. That is really fun to do, especially as a tanker myself. Um, we were taught to identify stuff, and so sometimes you literally have to use like the spacing of the road wheels in that. Kind of fun thing, but absolutely unnecessary. Now, guns are a bit different because they're really easy to mock up so that they look the part, and Oftentimes they can have a very significant effect on the plot. Like if you're showing a repeater in a time where those didn't exist, then suddenly you're giving your characters an incredible advantage for something that couldn't happen. Equipment and costumes and getting all of that right can get pretty expensive, so I tend to be fairly uncritical of that stuff. It's absurd to try to get every facet correct, especially when it doesn't affect the story. Besides, sometimes an aircraft carrier is just an aircraft carrier. No movie should try to tell every little bit of the story. Cradle to grave movies suck, and I wish Hollywood would get that through their mind, because they get everything wrong in the process of trying to go from birth to death in an entire movie. You got two hours to do something that took years. Stop that. You guys don't know how to tell those stories. Movies have to learn to pick their battles. Omissions are necessary. I mean, do you want to sit through a 10 hour movie? No. Then why are we trying to do Cradle to Graves? Why are we trying to do like, the entire story of this one person. Stop it. I mean, even historians have to pick their battles. We don't get to just have the entire story of this entire thing. We have to choose what we're talking about, especially depending on what sources we're using in that. But text is an abstract medium. Books have the capability of spanning vast amounts of time because it's all happening up here, but with a movie, that's not the case. It's really difficult to spend vast amounts of time in a movie without it becoming just an incredible mess. Plus, movies are not documentaries, so narration is normally pretty bad. Of course, shortening your story can also go bad, Sometimes the audience is expecting some part of a story to be told or, you know, you can make it feel like something is missing. But this is really a qualitative thing rather than like the previous ones where it's a quantitative thing. Tell the story you're capable of, not its entirety. The point is, these are necessary inaccuracies in movies. If it doesn't affect the narrative, then so be it. History is a story. It's in the name. No movie will ever be able to capture the full complexity that a book is capable of. I mean, do you really want, like, Eric Foner's reconstruction put to film? And this is an abridged version. The normal version is, like, giant. And yet, I could see somebody trying to put this to film, and that would be a mistake. If they pick their subject matter carefully, remain faithful to the story, and don't bungle up production, you really can't go wrong. If you want in-depth explorations of the problems of historicity in films, then I highly recommend these two books. 
These are particularly useful because they're edited volumes, which means that they have a different author for each chapter. They present a plethora of different viewpoints. And many of them are much more forgiving than I, but other ones are a lot less. In fact, I've had colleagues say that I go a little too easy on movies. Far be it from me to think that. <laughs> I don't think I'm a pushover at all. I am willing to forgive things, sure. The problem is even those mediocre expectations are fairly easily failed, apparently. I don't want perfect accuracy, as I've said many a time before, but I also understand the differences between the mediums. All I really want is good storytelling, and if a historian can do it, why can't multi-million dollar productions? As you can tell by now, no matter how much money you throw at something, there are inaccuracies that will inevitably be there and you just kinda gotta expect them. There's simply things that a movie cannot do. All mediums are limited in some way like this. I'm gonna do an internet! <laughs> For instance, I can't click on links in a book. Doesn't work. Well, I'm gonna do a book! Oh. And there's no audio or video that you can add to a book either. There are limits. Heck, think about it this way. The linear way that we have to read means that we have no ability to go back and forth. So for instance, characters talking over each other doesn't quite work in a book, and a movie can do that pretty well. I want you... Stop! This Think about the limits of the media that you partake. Because that medium implies a great deal of the message that you're going to get out of it. So if you're as concerned about accuracy as I am, then you'll probably like today's sponsor, CuriosityStream. They were founded by the same person who founded the Discovery Channel, so you know they're devoted to learning. There's more than 2,000 documentaries on all kinds of subjects, and it can be streamed to numerous devices including Android, iOS, Chromecast, and smart TVs. They have more than just history content, with stuff like science and tech programs as well. But you know what I gravitated to first? Given a certain final season is going on right now, it was a perfect time to catch up on the aptly named Real War of Thrones. The first season is about the Hundred Years War, and the second season is about the Wars of Religion. And if you think Game of Thrones is fun, then you'll love the history it's based on. So go to curiositystream.com slash cynicalhistorian You'll get the first 30 days free if you use the promo code CYNICALHISTORIAN during sign up. There's a lot there, so have fun, and I'll see you next time.